Looking at that big blue marble, your eyes may be drawn to the Gulf of Mexico where there's that large mass of clouds, but trouble is coming from the west out there in the Rockies. We'll take a look at that momentarily. So there we are. There's the visible imagery for the southeastern U.S. showing a broad shield of clouds. This is along a warm front, which is out there in Florida, transitioning to a cold front offshore. So this is Bear Clinic in nature. This used to be part of a hurricane out there in the eastern Pacific. It's crossed Mexico and moved out into the Gulf, and now we have a frontal system. And yeah, you can see the optical lightning detection. That's a new package added to the Gozar series of satellites, which came into operation several years ago. And with that, we can see a good cluster of storms moving up the coast there around West Palm Beach, maybe Vero Beach, and quite a bit more off the coast near Pensacola. Here's the surface map for late this afternoon, divided into several air masses. For one, we've got this tropical fetch coming up through Texas into the Ozarks, Missouri, Kansas, and we've also got this plateau region of air, continental tropical from Arizona to New Mexico. You can see the lower dew points there, 20s and 30s. We've also got kind of a transitional tropical air mass along the Gulf Coast, and then we get back into the pure tropical air mass over Florida, helping to support that thunderstorm activity. Further to the north, we've got a transitional air mass across the Great Lakes, temperatures in the 50s and 60s up there, and then we have a fresh round of cold Pacific air moving inland. That's it right there. Cool weather, 50s, 40s, and low dew points. So quite a menagerie of air masses involved in helping to support these fronts that I've got on the map. We do have a dry line from about Hayes, Kansas, down to about Clarendon, and down towards the Big Bend. The air mass too dry to support thunderstorm activity. Up to the north, though, there is a marginal risk for much of Iowa and parts of southeastern South Dakota and eastern Nebraska. That's going to be along that warm front right there. And we are getting some development right now. The optical lightning detection there picking up some thunderstorms up there north of Grand Island, but it does look a little bit elevated. Some other storms up there near Bethany, near the Iowa border, also not really doing a whole lot. And yes, it is quite active in the central Rockies. Thunderstorms, heavy showers, grapple, sleet, all of that from Salt Lake City to Denver along Interstate 70 and 80. And that's going to be spilling out onto the plains tomorrow. And we do have a high wind watch for parts of the central plains. We'll talk about that shortly. That cold air is feeding into the Great Basin area. You can see the thermal troughing right there with the dashed lines. That's going to be a cold air mass centered across Oregon and Washington. And with that cold air working into Nevada and Utah, we do have freeze warnings in effect from around Delta Caliente down to Area 51. So if you have UFOs parked outside, make sure any water lines are wrapped. Freeze watches and warnings as well from Reno on up towards around Susanville and on up north towards Burning Man, the playa. I wonder if all those people got out of there finally. It was quite a mess about a month ago, I think. And then heading up there into Alaska, stormy out there in the southern Gulf of Alaska. It's going to really go downhill here in the next several days. Cold air mass in place across Alaska, not much going on there. But once you go a little bit further west, a deep 950 millibar low out there around ADAC. And they do have a hurricane force wind warning for ADAC and Kiska, expecting southeast winds 50, gusting to 60 knots. Much of the southern Bering Sea and central Aleutians under a storm warning for tonight. Bad time to be out crab fishing. Closer to Anchorage and Valdez, just small craft advisories for now. And you can see this other system out there in the central Gulf of Alaska. That's going to be a 
complex frontal system with an occlusion right there. That's going to move right up there into southeastern Alaska, I think, tomorrow. Yeah, big AR surge into Alaska tomorrow. IVT values about 700 to 1,000 right in there. And there it comes. And then this other front comes through. Well, that's actually an occlusion right there. Let's draw that correctly. There we go. So that's an occlusion, but out to the west, watch this. The remnants of Super Typhoon Bolovin coming in from the west. There it is right there. And that is quite a storm there, down to 946 millibars by Monday night. And it's becoming frontal in nature. There's the fronts right there. There's the warm front. So this is a mature, slightly occluded system. Then as we go into Tuesday, some filling as it occludes and gets cut off from the triple point down to the south. But a big slug of moisture coming up into southeastern Alaska and even into British Columbia and Washington. Anyway, those central pressures, those are subject to change. The GFS had it all the way down to 927 millibars a couple days ago. So it's been kind of yo-yoing back and forth. So we'll just kind of keep an eye on it, but this will be certainly a very big system for early next week. Anyway, completing our tour of the weather, plenty of cold air locked up there in Elamir Island, Devon Island, and temperatures up there not terribly cold, although at Eureka I do see 9 degrees. But we are transitioning into late fall, very gradually, and we will see it get much colder up in that region. The prairies looking pretty warm, 50s and a few 60s in Alberta and Saskatchewan, then heading out to the east, a very persistent occlusion in Quebec. They've had several days of rain right there from Montreal to North Bay, and that system is gradually weakening right now as the tail end works offshore. A quick look at the jet stream does show that it is a little bit blocky. We've got this omega block right there. That's a big cutoff high across Nunavut. That's responsible for some of those warmer temperatures in the prairies. And on either side, we've got cutoff lows right there and one in the northwestern U.S. Down to the south, though, long fetch of polar front jet energy across Nevada all the way out towards Tennessee and the Carolinas. Winds up to 110 knots. We've got this digging jet right there for tomorrow into the Four Corners area. That's going to be putting the, the Colorado region under this divergent left front quadrant and helping to support some of the inclement weather there that we're going to be seeing tomorrow. That's going to be also be pressure falls. That's going to be a good area for cyclogenesis, and that will help draw warm air and moisture northward. And the flip side of that is going to play out on the surface chart. So let's go ahead and look at that. This is what we have right now. Let's draw out those fronts. They're going to be roughly in this area right here, kind of like that. Warm front on off to the east and that secondary frontal system down there on the Gulf Coast. The dry line, that's not really going to show up on this data. We really need dew points to plot that, but that's going to be the dry line. We know that from the surface analysis earlier. All right, so going into the overnight hours into tomorrow, cyclogenesis continues on the high plains, especially there around Goodland and North Platte. And what we're going to watch for is the cold air advection starting to surge south in Colorado and western Nebraska. And that's really going to kick up the winds once it starts moving. So now we're up to dawn. And let's bring it up to midday. All right, starting to see some of the precip transitioning over to snow in Wyoming. And I'll give you this look at the projected snow amounts from the NEM model. You can see that most of this is going to be up in the mountains above 7,000 to 8,000 feet, but it will be heavy. Some areas way up near the summits will get 10 to 20 inches, especially in Wyoming. So there you go. You can see that even the Black Hills getting some snow and out, out around Scotts Bluff and Ainsworth, possibly some snow as well. So that's what we've got right there by Friday morning. Extensive one to three amounts in the valleys likely with higher amounts up in the mountains. And they do have winter weather advisories and winter storm warnings up in that region and some of those extending down into Colorado. That's going to be the comma head right there feeding 
moisture and cold air westward and helping, helping to support this wintry activity. Then by evening, yeah, now the cold air is pushing south. Can't really tell exactly where it is, but I'm going to say it's right in here. That's going to be a big push of cold air coming south and possibly kicking up some dust in some areas as well. And there's what we have at midnight. Let me draw out the fronts. There's the warm front. There's the Canadian cold front. Looks like that's pushing through Dodge City. And the Pacific front. We've kind of lost track of that, but I suspect it's running about like that. So Pacific air coming into New Mexico. Canadian air coming south like that. And the dry line that is probably pushed out maybe something like that. So that's the setup for midnight tomorrow night. There's Friday morning, some of the precept coming to a close there around Wyoming and Colorado. And then we go into Friday, and that's the picture that we'll have for the Friday weather cast. And yeah, it's quite stormy out there in the Gulf. I was looking at the surface data, some gusts up near 40 to 50 knots in the center of the low pressure area right there, and that is tracking right on up towards western Florida. There's the latest high resolution rapid refresh showing that low moving on up right up there towards Panama City by late tonight and bringing this band of showers and storms up towards Tallahassee, Gainesville, and Apalachicola. And yes, we do have a solar eclipse coming up for Saturday, so there's the cloud cover forecast from the GFS. That's about the best data that we have. The red band is the center of the eclipse. That's where you're going to see the ring around the sun. And as you get further away from that red band, you get from about 80-90% coverage down to about 20-30% to in the northeastern U.S. So all of the U.S. to some extent is going to see the sun being blocked. But the best viewing conditions, as you can see, around Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and worse conditions in the Midwest and Northeastern U.S. And that's it for this edition of Forecast Lab. Hopefully this was educational and informative. There was a lot to cover today and it felt like a little bit like a horse race, but I think we did get through it and covered most everything we wanted to talk about. I want to thank our many supporters out there. Chris Hobbs, Fred Reamer, Thomas Wozencraft, Adam Wolfs, Amos Yost, people like that are essential to this program, and I thank all of you very much for your continued support. All right, hope you have a great Wednesday night and Thursday, and we'll talk to you again on Friday. Take care. Bye-bye.